Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. One of the world's most extensive grasslands is located here in the central part of Argentina in an area called the Pampas. The Pampas is the home of a large flightless bird, which is one of the most unusual species in the wild kingdom, the rhea. About half the size of an ostrich, it can outrun a horse for a short distance. This bird is the subject of extensive research by the New York Zoological Society, and Wild Kingdom's Dick Denny was recently invited to observe some of that research. There may be 30 or more eggs like this in the rhea's nest, but they're laid by different females. One of the unusual things about the rhea is that it's the male who builds the nest, mates with several females who lay their eggs in his nest, and he then incubates the eggs and raises the young. Our observations of the rhea took place at a huge cattle ranch about 150 miles from Buenos Aires. We were soon calling that area the realm of the rhea. The pampas of the Argentine is a vast sea of lush grasses dotted here and there with small islands of trees. No bird of this terrain is more distinctive than the large, long-legged rhea. Despite its ability to run with extraordinary swiftness, normally this big bird walks about casually. The noisy lapwing is here, as are the equally vociferous screamers, which are related to the guinea fowl. Their raucous cries identify them but they're also easily recognizable by their neck bands, a narrow white one and a broad black one, and by the fact that they like to move about in groups. Such bird neighbors as these, however, are generally ignored by the rhea, as are the characteristically unruly birds of prey called chimangos. Though there's more than enough of the carcass to feed all of the chimangos present, they still tend to squabble over possession of it. The chimangos and the rias are familiar sights to the ranchmen known as gauchos, who work here, and to the scientist who has been escorting Dick Denny through this realm of the Rhea. Guiding me is the renowned Rhea expert, Dr. Donald Bruning of the New York Zoological Society, who knows these gauchos well and has been aided by them considerably. Comparable to the cowboys of the American West, these gauchos know every inch of this huge cattle ranch and initially directed Dr. Bruning in locating the big birds. The foreman of the ranch, or estancia as they call it, has scores of riders working for him in the operation of this estancia, El Cajijon. Although he's essentially like the manager of a ranch in our own West, Francis Lockie is in the saddle far more than the average American cowboy. His horse is large and powerful, as are all the horses on the pampas. And his fleece saddle and fancy stirrups are much different from ours. We're letting Lockie know where we'll be observing today, which doesn't conflict with him and his gaucho, who will be going the other way. So vast is this estancia, it's altogether likely that every horse in the string, or remuda as it's called, will be used by the two gauchos on their cattle herd inspection. There's a sense of endlessness to the pampas that's well deserved, and it's been a long walk here from the camp of Dr. Bruning. Ahead of us are Rias a harem of females that are being attended by a male.
He has won them through his spread wing displays in which he competed for them against other males. Having accepted him, the females will stay with him in a fairly firm group while he mates with them and continues to display with spread wings which maintains the bond between them. The movements of head and wings are very important and the male will display to them up to 10 times per hour. Eventually, the male leads them to a site where he builds a nest depression. Here, the females will lay their eggs for him and then, sometimes, simply wander away. They'll no doubt be attracted by the wing displays of other male birds. The research being undertaken at this time is really more concerned with the actions of the males during incubation than in the display behavior. Some incubation has been occurring in this direction. I wanted Dick to see how the incubating male feigns injury to lure intruders away from the nest. The opened, drooping wings, the ruffled feathers, and a stumbling walk are all designed to make us think he's hurt, and we can catch him if we give chase. If we chased, he'd simply continue to keep ahead and lead us on. Seeing that we're not chasing him, the male pretends to be collapsing. He'll return to his nest quickly, as soon as we depart from this area. Dr. Bruning and Dick Denny headed for a large nest the ornithologist had located a week earlier in the fringe of a small island of trees, where they hoped to be able to observe the nesting activities without being seen. The two men have come to this location specifically because Don knows a male bird has been incubating here. It's a substantial nest of eggs, and thus far there's no indication that the male is aware of the presence of the researchers. The rhea may leave the eggs uncovered for an hour on warm days, but rarely over 10 minutes when it's cool. Incubating a large clutch of eggs is a monotonous job, and it's a good time to catch a little nap. But the sleepiness descending over the big bird does not indicate a slackening of its awareness. It's a henria of his harem who's ready to lay an egg in the nest. She's not bothered by the threatening attitude and the menacing hissing of the male, knowing instinctively that if she's submissive, there'll be no problem. The male will watch her constantly, but he's gradually calming. Egg laying is almost always done just after noon on the outer fringe of the nest, and this hen's ready to lay her egg right now. Unlike many female birds, which have to remain stationary for hours in order to lay an egg, rhea hens do the job rather quickly. Rhea eggs are quite golden colored when first laid, but they soon fade. Neither bird has been aware of our presence to witness the laying, so we've been very fortunate. We'll leave the male alone with his clutch now. All too often, 
the rear eggs are laid out in the open by females who are leading one male to look for another. Such eggs invariably spoil. They're quite large and have a remarkably tough shell, one that can take considerable abuse. Eggs are not indestructible. Now, as we move on to try to locate some hatching rear eggs in nearby nests, I can see ahead of us on a fence post of the cattle ranch one of the more unusual birds of the pampas, the oven bird, which is named after the strange nest it builds. Since Dick hasn't observed them closely before, I suggest that he do so, while I write some comments about today's observations so far. Also called the Ornero, it is Argentina's national bird and noteworthy for the complicated mud nest it builds with great care. When completed, the nest bears a resemblance to a Dutch oven, and that's where the bird gets the name oven bird. A nest like this, constructed of mud on a post or branch, is built by the mated pair in a surprisingly short time, partly because it's a teamwork effort at which they labor with great skill and determination until the job's completed. They're insect eaters, and are valuable in controlling insects injurious to crops. They're also a very widespread family, inhabiting every type of terrain, from tropical jungle and desert to the snow line in cooler regions. The mud is mixed with grasses and tamped in carefully with the beak. Once the mud has baked dry in the sun, the nest becomes very strong and lasts for years, though the birds build a new one for each nesting. Over in this direction, there's one of the old abandoned nests on another fence post. It'll be ideal to take apart for a close look at the unusual nature of the interior construction. The birds working nearby are curious, but unafraid. By using the small handsaw I carry in my pack, it'll be possible for me to remove a section from the old nest in order to show that it's not just a hollow ball, but rather an unusual chambered interior. Not only has this old nest been abandoned, but it was evidently damaged some time ago. It wasn't apparent at first glance from the sides, but there is a rather large hole in the dome-like top, which will become evident when the sod portion is removed. There's no way of determining now what caused the hole in the first place. However, it hasn't broken the chambered interior, which holds nesting material in the main portion, and a sort of passageway chamber, which was a baffle of some kind. Perhaps it kept rain from blowing into the nest chamber. It probably won't do much good to put it back together, but there's a chance that something might be able to use the old nest if it's not blown apart by a storm.
Nearby, the oven birds are still at work, unperturbed. And now it's time for me to get back to where Dr. Bruning's waiting. One of the more incredible things about the Rias was how the huge male birds on their nests could flatten out and become practically invisible in grass little more than ankle deep. Dr. Bruning and Dick Denny are about to encounter an excellent example of the Rhea's uncanny skill for hiding where it doesn't seem possible. As usual, it begins feigning injury. Once again, as the bird's actions are ignored, it feigns injury even more dramatically until it finally collapses. However, the men ignore it and instead advance on the nest filled with eggs. According to Dr. Bruning, this is about an average size clutch of close to 40 eggs. Whenever we're able to locate a nest like this, we record the number and condition of the eggs and whether or not laying is completed. From the golden coloration still evident on this egg, laying still occurring. Incubation takes 36 days. When it's completed, some other observations can be made and notes taken about the hatching and related matters. In order to find this location again, we make a simple triangulation of the site by taking directional readings with an ordinary compass. By closely estimating the distance to a far clump of trees and recording an accurate degree reading and then repeating this process in two or three other directions, we can pinpoint the exact nest site and return without difficulty. This was the method we used a few weeks ago when we located one of the earliest nests here. That's where we should be able to see some of the actual hatching occurring today. And so we'll head there now. Here's the nest now. And exactly according to our calculations, there's already one egg that is pipped and an active chick inside that's ready to come out into the world. We're confident the chick will emerge momentarily, using its powerful legs to help thrust itself out of the shell. As it is for all birds, Hatching is an exhausting process for the baby Rhea, and it's necessary for it to rest now and then before resuming the struggle to get free. It's a very tired little chick, but within an hour or so, it will be able to stand up. However, it'll stay close to the nest and be brooded for 36 hours by the male while other chicks hatch. Then, all will follow him away. That's what's been occurring nearby at a slightly more advanced nest. Right now, the chicks have to run to keep up with the walk of the adult, but they'll develop rapidly and soon be able to keep up with the parent bird under almost any conditions. Rias are closely protected here and on some of the other vast cattle estancias like this, because once each year they are captured and have their tail feathers plucked 
as a harvestable crop. The rheas of the pampas are still wild birds, but man has learned to both preserve and utilize them here on the expansive Argentinian pampas, the realm of the rhea. Grasslands are ordinarily lands which are very rich and lend themselves admirably to agricultural development. Thus, they're usually very quickly converted to farmlands. Too few natural grasslands like the Argentine pampas still exist, but there are some. While they still survive, it is important to set aside large representative portions of such habitat as natural areas. Doing this will ensure a continuation of not only the grasslands, but equally the wildlife upon them. In that way, both grasslands and wildlife will always remain what they are now, an important part of the wild kingdom.